Today we're going to be talking about nutrition and hydration. So with nutrition and hydration, we're going to look at the basics of each. So in your book at box 45.1, it gives you a good review over nutrition. Nutrition is a basic component of health and is essential for normal growth and development, tissue maintenance and repair, cellular metabolism and organ function. Adequate access to nutrition is imperative to attain and maintain this component of health. In 2015, nearly 42.2 million Americans lived in a household that lacked access to proper nutrition. Food security is cr critical for all members of the household. This term means that all household members have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Medical nutrition therapy is used um, as a nutrition therapy in counseling to manage diseases. In some illnesses, such as type 1 diabetes or mild hypertension, diet therapy often is the major treatment for this disease to help control it. So I want you to review your textbook, this section over scientific knowledge base to understand um, the basics of nutrition. You all have had a nutrition class for nursing school, but just to review the basics of each part of the nutrition. So the scientific knowledge base, so we're going to kind of do some basic anatomy and physiology here. So this figure, figure is in your book, okay, it's a summary of the digest, digestive system, anatomy, organ function, um, hydrochloric acid, um, how it goes through your digestive system. So the digestion of food is the mechanical breakdown that results from chewing, churning, mixing with fluid and chemical reactions into which the food reduces to the simplest form. Each part of the GI system has an important digestive or absorption function. Enzymes are the protein-like substance that acts as a catalyst to speed up the chemical reaction. They are an essential part of the chemistry of digestion. And again, if you'll review just the basics of digestion in your book to better understand the anatomy part. Scientific knowledge base. Um, Again, we're looking at absorption. So the body absorbs nutrients by means of passive diffusion, osmosis, active transport, and menocytosis. Metabolism and storage of nutrients, all biochemical reactions within in the cells of the body is where that metabolism occurs and nutrients are stored. Elimination, so chyme moves from the biperistaltic action through the ileocecal valve into the large intestine where it becomes feces. So, and then that's where we eliminate it. And then we also know about urinary elimination. So with the choosemyplate.gov, so in your book, this is listed. So dietary guidelines, these are dietary reference intakes their dietary reference intakes present evidence-based criteria for acceptable range of amount of vitamins and nutrients for each gender and age group. So there's four components of this. There's the estimated average requirement that is recommended among amount of the nutrients that appear sufficient to maintain a specific body function for 50% of the population on the basis of age and gender. Then you have the recommended dietary allowance that represents the average need of 98% of the population, not the exact needs of each individual. And then you have the adequate intake. This is the suggested intake for individuals based on observed or experimentally determined estimates of nutrient intakes and is used when there is not enough evidence to set the RDA. And then you have the tolerable upper intake level is the highest level that likely poses no risk of adverse effect um, adverse health events. It is not a recommended level of intake. You also have the food guidelines. So the U.S. Department of Health um, and Human Services has developed dietary guidelines from 2015 to 2020, and these provide an average daily consumption guideline for five food groups, grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy, dairy products, and meats. These guidelines are for Americans over the age of two. As a nurse, you must consider the food preferences of the patient from different cultures, groups, vegetarians, and others when planning a diet. 
The USDA developed a Choose My Plate program to replace the My Food Pyramid program. The Choose My um, Plate program provides a basic guide for making food choices for healthy lifestyle. It includes guidelines for balancing calories, decreasing portion size, increasing healthy foods, increasing water consumption, and decreasing fat, sodium, and sugar. So your daily values. So the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has created da daily values for food labels in response to the 1990 Nutrition Labeling and Education Act. The FDA first established two sets of reference values. The reference daily intakes, or the RDIs, are the first set comprising of proteins, vitamins, and minerals based on the RDA. The daily reference values, or the DRVs, make up the second set and consist of nutrients such as total fat, saturated fat, cholesterol, carbohydrates, fiber, sodium, and potassium. Combined, both sets make up the daily value used on food labels. Daily values do not replace the RDAs, but provide a separate, more understandable format for the public to understand what they're taking in. Daily values are based on the percentage of a diet consisting of 2,000 kilocalories per day for an adult and, a, and children four years and older. So let's, let's look at this quiz question. So a 22-year-old new mother is breastfeeding. You ask her if she is taking the correct quantity of nutrients. Which statement reflects that she understands the dietary guidelines? A, I am not concerned with what I'm eating. B, I am taking vitamin doses based on TV. C, I am taking my daily multivitamin. Or D, I am making eating choices according to the recommended dietary allowances. So the most appropriate answer would be D. I am making eating choices according to a recommended dietary allowance. We do want her to take a daily vitamin, and that's going to help. But first and foremost, we want her to make sure that she is eating a good diet for her and baby. So the nursing knowledge based. So um, in your book, you have boxes 43 point. 45.3 and 45.4, and then 45.2. This is going to also help you understand the nursing knowledge base. So environmental factors, environmental factors beyond the control of an individual contribute to the development of obesity. Obesity is an epidemic. 68.7% of Americans are overweight or obese. Overweight is considered a BMI of 25 to 29. Obese is a BMI greater than 30. So we've got to look at the separate developmental needs for each age group. So infants to school age, there's rapid growth and high protein, vitamin, mineral, and energy requirements mark the development stage of infancy. Breastfeeding formula and introduction um, to solid foods occurs during this time. I always say fed is best, breast is best has been a slogan, but fed is best is the best slogan. If a mother chooses to formula feed, that is understandable and okay. If she's unable to breastfeed or she chooses not to breastfeed. Um, if you have a mother who's breastfeeding and having difficulties supplementing using alternative medicine, uh, methods like cupping or a, um, a kangaroo feeding system along with breastfeeding is going to help that baby take in the nutrients it needs. Childhood obesity contributes to the medical problems related to the cardiovascular system. So adolescents during the adolescent um, Physiological age is a better guide to nutritional needs than chronological age. Energy needs increase to meet greater metabolic demands of growth. Daily requirements of protein also increases. Calcium is essential for rapid bone growth of adolescents, and girls need a continuous source of iron to replace menstrual losses. Boys also need adequate iron for muscle development. Iodine supports increased thyroid activity, and the use of iodized table salt ensures availability. B-complex vitamins are necessary to support heightened metabolic activity. Um, fortified foods, this is uh, foods that have nutrients added, are an important source of vitamins and minerals. Snack foods from dairy, fruit, and vegetable groups are good choices. To counter obesity, increasing phys physical activity is often more important than curbing intake. The onset of eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa often occur during adolescence. Recognition of eating disorders is essential for early prevention. Pregnancy occurring within the four years of menarche um, place a mother and the fetus at risk of um, because of an because of anatomical and physiological immaturity. 
Malnutrition at the time of conception increases the risk to the adolescent and her fetus. Most teenage girls do not want to gain weight. Counseling related to nutritional needs of the pregnancy is often difficult and teens tolerate suggestions better than rigid direction. The diet of a pregnant adolescent is often deficient in calcium, iron, vitamin A, and C. The um, ACOG recommends prenatal vitamins and mineral supplements, especially for this age group. Young and middle adults, there is a reduction in nutrient demands as the growth period ends. Mature adults need nutrients for energy, maintenance, and repair. Energy needs usually decline over the years. Obesity becomes a problem because of decreased physical exercise, dining out more often, and increased ability to afford more luxury foods. Adult women who use contraceptive often need extra vitamins. Iron and calcium intake continue to be important. And then, of course, folic acid. Pregnancy, poor nutrition during pregnancy causes low birth weight in infants and decreases chances of survival. Generally, meeting the needs of the fetus is at the expense of the mother. However, the nutrient sources are unavailable. Both will suffer. In lactation, women are lacta lactating women are in need of 500 kilocalories um, per day above the usual allowance um, because the production of milk increases energy requirements. Protein requirements during lactation are greater than those required during pregnancy. The need for calcium remains the same during pregnancy. There is an increased need for vitamin A and C. Daily intake of water-soluble vitamins B and C is necessary to ensure adequate levels in the breast milk. Fluid intake needs to be adequate but not excessive. Excretion of caffeine, alcohol, and drugs occurs through the black breast milk. Therefore, mothers who are lactating need to avoid their ingestion. Older adults we will discuss a little further on in the lecture. So nursing um, knowledge base, we're going to look at alternative food patterns. Many people follow special patterns of food intake on the basis of religious, cultural background, health benefits, personal preference, or concern for the efficient use of land to produce food. Vegetarian diets are more common these days. Consumption of a diet consisting predominantly of plant-based foods. And of course, there's lots of different subcategories within there. So successful critical thinking requires a synthesis of knowledge, experience, information gathered from patients, critical thinking, attitudes, and intellectual professional standards. Clinical judgments require you to anticipate information, analyze the data, and make decisions regarding your patient's care. During assessment, consider all the elements that build together, making an appropriate nursing diagnosis. Integrate knowledge from nursing and other disciplines Previous experiences and information gathered from patients and family regarding customary food preferences and recent diet history. Use of professional standards such as um, DRIs, the USDA, My Plate Dietary Guidelines, and Healthy People 2020 Objectives provide guidelines to assess and maintain patients' nutritional status. Other professional standards by the AHA, the American Diabetes Association, and the ACS, and the American Society of perinatal and internal guidelines are available. These standards are evidence-based and regularly, regularly updated for optimal patient care. So shown is um, figure 45.4 from your textbook, the mini nutritional assessment. So let's look through the patient's eyes. Close contact with patients and their families enables you to observe physical status, food intake, food preferences, weight changes, and cultural practices in eating. Always ask patients about their food preference, values regarding nutrition, and expectations for nutritional therapy. For example, does a patient want to learn about diet? In attempting to affect um, eating patterns, you need to understand patients' values, beliefs, and attitudes about food. Assess family tradition and rituals related to food cultural values and beliefs, and nutritional needs. Determine how factors affect food purchase and preparation and intake. So screenings, you're gonna assess patients' nutritional status by using the nursing history to gather information about factors that actually usually in influenced nutrition. You are in an excellent position to recognize signs of poor nutrition and take steps to initiate change. 
Nutrition screening is an essential part of the initial assessment. Screening a patient is a quick method for identifying malnutrition or risk of malnutrition using simple tools. Nutrition screening tools gather data on the current condition and typically include objective measures such as height, weight, weight change, primary diagnosis, and the presence of any other comorbidities. Combine multiple objective measures with subjective measures related to nutrition to adequately screen for nutritional problems. Identification of risk factors such as unintentional weight loss, presence of modified diet, and the, or the presence of altered nutrition symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation requires nutritional consultations. Several standardized nutritional screening tools are available for use in outpatient and inpatient settings. So continuing on with the nursing process, we're going to look at assessment. So anthropometry, anthropometry is a systemic method of measuring the size and makeup of the body. Nurses obtain height and weight for each patient on a hospital admission and entry into the healthcare setting. If you're unable to measure height with the patient standing, position him lying flat in bed as straight as possible with his arms folded over his chest and measure him um, or her lengthwise. Serial measures of weight over time provide more useful information than one measurement. Weigh the patient at the same time each day on the same scale and with the same type of clothing or linen. Document the patient's actual weight and compare height to, and weight with standards for height-weight relationships. Ideal body weight, or the IBW, provides an estimate of what a person should weigh. The BMI or body mass index measures weight cor um, corrected by height and serves as an alternative to traditional height weight relationships. So what are some laboratory biochemical tests? There's not any single laboratory bi biochemical test in diagnostics for malnutrition. Further that, factors that frequently um, alter test results include fluid balance, liver function, kidney function, and the presence of any type of disease. Common laboratory tests used to study nutritional status include measurements of plasma proteins such as albumin, transferrin, prealbumin, retinol binding protein, total iron binding capacity, and hemoglobin. Under the diet history and health history, in addition to general nursing history, you need to collect the data for more specific diet history to assess a patient's actual or potential nutritional needs. In box 45.6 in your book, it lists some specific assessment questions to ask in the diet history. The diet history focuses on the patient's habitual intake of foods and liquids and it includes information about preferences, allergies, and other relevant areas such as the patient's ability to attain food. Gather information about the patient's illness, activity level to determine energy needs, and compare with food intake. Your nursing assessment of the nutrition includes health status, age, cultural background, religious food patterns, socioeconomic status, personal food preferences, psychological factors, use of alcohol or illegal drugs, use of vitamins, minerals, and herbal supplements, prescription or over-the-counter drugs, and the patient's general nutrition knowledge. On physical examination, this is one of the most important aspects of the nutritional assessment because improper nutrition affects all the body systems. You can observe for nutritional mal you can observe for malnutrition during physical assessment. Complete the general physical assessment of the body systems and recheck relevant areas to evaluate a patient's nutritional status. The clinical signs of nutritional status um, serve as guidelines for observation during physical assessment, and this is found on table 45.4 in your book. Dysphagia refers to difficulty swallowing. There are a variety of causes and complications of dysphagia. Complications include aspiration pneumonia, dehydration, decreased nut nutritional status, and weight loss. Dysphagia leads to disability or decreased functional status, increased length of stay and healthcare costs, increased likelihood of discharge to institutionalized care, and increased mortality. Be aware of warning signs for dysphagia. They include cough during eating, change in voice tone or quality after swallowing, abnormal movements of the mouth, tongue, or lips, and slow, weak, imprecise, or uncoordinated speech. Abnormal gag, delayed swallowing, incomplete oral clearance or pocketing, regurgitation, pharyngeal pulling, delayed or present trigger, 
of swallow and inability to speak consistently are other signs of dysphagia. Patients with dysphagia often do not show signs such as coughing when food enters the airway. Dysphagia often leads to an inadequate amount of food intake, which results to malnutrition. Dysphagia screening quickly identifies problems with swallowing and helps you initiate referrals for more in-depth assessments by a registered dietitian or a speech pathologist. So nursing diagnosis. So you're going to cluster all of the assessment data to identify appropriate nursing diagnoses together, and you can find these in box 45.8 in your book. So nutritional problem that occurs when overall intake is significantly decreased or increased or when more or one or when more, one or more nutrients are not ingested, completely digested or completely absorbed. When identifying a negative or problem focused nursing diagnosis, you select the appropriate related factors, such as an ability to digest food or reduce daily activity. Related factors need to be accurate, so you select the right intervention. For example, impaired low nutritional intake related to economic disadvantage will require very different interventions when impaired low nutritional intake related to inability to digest food. The following are examples of nursing diagnoses applicable to nutritional problems. So risk for aspiration, overweight, impaired low nutritional intake, impaired self-feeding, impaired swallowing. In addition, there are clinical situations in which a patient have multiple related nursing diagnoses. So it may not just be one, it could be several of these. So planning, you're gonna look at goals and outcomes. So reflect on a patient's um, physiological, therapeutic, and individualized needs. You're gonna set priorities for each patient based on each patient's need. Teamwork and collaboration. You're gonna learn, work along with many other people just like we've always talked with registered dietitians. You're gonna have a discharge planner involved. Um, if they need internal um, feedings, then we're gonna also probably have home health involved. So teamwork and collaboration are very important. So implementations. So we're gonna provide some implementations for health promotion. So we're gonna definitely educate. We're gonna identify any potential or actual problems early on. We're gonna look at meal planning, weight loss plans, and food safety. So you're gonna to need to review 45.6 and box 45.10 in your textbook. Shown is from your textbook, it's adapt adaptive equipment. So clockwise from the upper left, you have two handled cup, plate with plate guard so they can scoop up food onto the utensil, utensil with splints and utensils with large handles. And these are allow, um, helpful for people who have had like strokes or other um, neurological disorders that they need help um, being able to feed themselves. So in acute care, what are some risk factors in acutely ill patients? So one is diet. If they're not able to feed themselves, that's a big thing. Advancing diets, we need to do gradual progression of dietary intake or therapeutic diet to manage the illness. So we need to make sure we're not advancing too quick, that we're keeping them on the appropriate type of diet, be it soft, um, um, ground, thick and liquids. There's a whole array of different diets that um, patients who have um, health issues may have to be on. We're gonna promote appetite and we're gonna assist with oral feedings. Sometimes if a patient is not able to feed themselves, they may require enteral feedings. Um, so these enteral feeding tubes um, provide nutrients into the GI tract. It is a physiological, safe, and economical nutritional support. So you're gonna have internal enteral formulas. You have four different types. So polymeric, which is a milk-based blended food prepared by staff at the hospital. Modular, which consists of macronutrients that are added to the supplemental diet. Elemental contains pre-digested nutrients that are easier for a partially dysfunctional GI tract to absorb. Specialty, these are designed to meet um, specific neutral, nutritional needs. And complications, most common for anyone who's on these type of feedings is aspiration.
So here you can see some examples of enteral access tubes. Um, these are also found in your book. So A is an enteral tube, small bore, so it's one that can either go through the nose and may also be used through a ET tube if someone is intubated. B is the connector only. It's the part where you are going to actually pour in the nutrients or whatever um, formula that they are going to be fed. So some examples of um, enteral um, access tubes, you have nas nasogastric, gast gastrostomy, gastrostomy or jujinstomy, um, the PEG tube, which is a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or the jujinostomy. So they can either go into the actual stomach or they can go into the small intestines. So when you have a patient who are unable to ingest foods but are still able to digest and absorb nutrients, this is the type of feeding they will be receiving. So question two, you receive an order to begin enteral tube feedings. The first step is to A, place the patient in the prone position, B, irrigate the tube with small, with normal saline, C, check to see that the tube is properly placed, or D, introduce a small amount of fluid into the tube before feeding. So let's break down this question. So you've received an order to begin the enteral tube feeding. So the tube's already been placed, okay? So prone is not appropriate because if we place a patient in the prone position, they're immediately going to possibly aspirate because that liquid can come up into the esophagus and down into the lungs. Um, irrigate the tube with a normal saline. This is not um, always necessary, and normal saline can also be contraindicated. It probably is going to be sterile water because of the saline itself, the, the salt content. Um, check to see if the tube is properly placed. If it's already been placed and we are now beginning the process of feeding the patient, we know it's already been checked, so that is not an appropriate answer. And then D, introduce a small amount of fluid into the tube before feeding, and that is correct. And most of the time, this is going to be sterile water, not normal saline. So D is the correct answer. So implementation of parenteral feedings. So parenteral feedings, or PN, is a form of specialized nutritional support provided intravenously. Patients who are unable to digest or absorb um, the internal or enteral nutrition benefit from the PN. Patients in highly stressed physiological states such as sepsis, head injuries, or burns are candidates for the PN therapy. A basic PN formula is a combination of crystalline amino acids, hypertonic dextrose, electrolytes, vitamins, and trace elements. Total PN or TPN administered through a central line is a two-in-one formula in which administration of fat em emulsions occur separately from the protein and dextrose solutions. Safe administration depends on the appropriate assessment of the nutritional needs. Meticulous, meticulous management of the central venous catheter um, is important and careful monitoring to prevent or treat metabolic complications is also very important. PN therapy requires a clinical and laboratory monitoring by an interprofessional team. Consistent reevaluation for the continuation of PN is required. So we're looking at the lab values. What we're doing is that keeping them um, with the normal, are they low, are they high? So this is going to be working along with your physician, your registered dietitian, um, along with other laboratory specialists to make sure that you're maintaining appropriate amount of um, vitamins and nutrients for this patient. So initiating um, PN patients with short-term nutritional needs often receive IV solutions of less than 10% dextrose via peripheral line in a combination with amino acids and lipids. TPN is more calorically dense than peripheral solutions. Therefore, peripheral solutions are usually temporary. So peripheral means like IV lines in your arms, legs, other parts of your body. So TPN is going to administer, be administered through that central um, venous catheter. So it's going to be like a J, uh, jugular vein or a bigger vein in the leg or like the femoral artery or femoral vein. That is what they're going to use to administer the TPN. Um, 
PN with greater than 10% dextrose requires the CVC that a healthcare provider places into a high flow central vein, such as a superior vena cava under sterile conditions. If you're using a CVC that is, has multiple lumens, use a port exclusively dedicated for the TPN. Label the port for TPN and do not infuse other solutions or medications through it. Complications of PN include catheter-related problems and metabolic alterations. So patients discharged from the hospital with diet prescriptions often need dietary education to plan meals that meet specific therapeutic requirements. Restorative care includes both immediate post-surgical care and routine medical care, and therefore includes patients in the hospital and at home. So medical nutrition therapy, or MNT, is the use of specific nutritional therapies to treat an illness, injury, or condition. It is necessary to help the body metabolize certain nutrients, correct nutritional deficiencies related to a disease, and eliminate foods that may exacerbate disease systems. So gastrointestinal diseases we're going to look at, you can have the peptic ulcers um, that can be controlled with meals or other medications such as histamine receptors, receptor antagonists that block secretion of the HCL or proton pump inhibitors. You have H. pylori. So a lot of times H. pylori most of the time has to be treated with antibiotics and then other proton pump inhibitors. Inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or idiopathic ulcerative colitis. Treatment is elemental diets or PN when systems or when symptoms such as diarrhea and weight loss are prevalent. Management includes decreasing fiber, reducing fat, avoiding large meals, and avoiding lactose or sorbitol containing foods, which is avocados. Malabsorption syndromes, such celiac disease, these people just have to be on a gluten free diet. Diverticulitis. Um, is a moderate to low residue diet until the infection subsides. So diverticulitis is inflammation of the diverticuli, which are these little pockets outside of the large intestines. So diverticulosis is the disease itself, but diverticulitis is when you have an infection in those little pockets. Diabetes mellitus, so you have type 1 diabetes, requires both insulin and dietary management for optimal control with treatments beginning at diagnosis. And then contrast patients often control type 2 diabetes initially with exercise and diet therapy. If these measures prove ineffective, it is common to add oral medications. Insulin injections often follow in type 2 diabetes if it worsens or fails to respond to the initial interventions. Cardiovascular diseases. The goal of the American Heart Association um, dietary guidelines is to reduce risk factors for developmental or hypertensive or coronary artery disease. Diet therapy for reducing the risk of cardiovascular includes balancing calorie intake and exercise to maintain a healthy body weight, eating a, high, a diet high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grain, high fiber foods, eating fish at least two times a week, and limiting food and beverages that are high added sugar or salt. The American Heart Association guidelines also recommend limiting saturated fat to less than 7%, trans fat to less than 1%, and cholesterol to less than 300 milligrams per day. To accomplish this goal, patients choose to choose lean meats, vegetables, use fat-free dairy products, and limit intake of fats and sodium. Cancer treatment, malignant cells compete with normal cells for nutrients, increasing a patient's metabolic needs. Most cancer treatments cause nutritional problems. Patient with cancer often experience anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and taste distortions. The goal of the nutritional therapy is to meet the increased metabolic need of the patient. HIV or AIDS, um, with these patients typical experience body, they typically experience body wasting and severe weight loss related to anorexia, stomatitis, which is the sore mouth, oral thrush infections, nausea or recurrent vomiting, all resulting in, adequate in, in inadequate intake. Factors associated with weight loss and malnutrition include severe diarrhea, GI malabsorption and altered met metabolism of nutrients. Restorative care of malnutrition resulting from AIDS focus on, focuses on maximizing kilocalories and nutrients. Address each cause of nutritional depletion in the care plan. The progression of individually tailored nutrition support, nutritional support begins with administering, administering oral to internal and finally to perinatal, um, parenteal nutrition. 
Sorry, guys, my brain is slowing down. <laughs> so evaluation. We're going to look through the patient's eyes again. So patients expect competent, timely, and accurate care. Patients also expect nurses to determine when nutritional therapies do not result in successful outcome and alter the plan of care accordingly. Expectations and healthcare values held by nurses frequently differ from those held by the patients. So successful intervention and outcomes require nurses to know what, patient ex what patients expect in addition to nursing, knowledge and skill, work closely with the patient to confirm their expectations and talk with them about their concerns if their expectations are not realistic. Consider the limits of your patient's condition and treatment, their dietary preferences, and their cultural beliefs with evalu when evaluating outcomes. So with these patient outcomes, care plans need to reflect achievable goals and outcome. Evaluate actual outcomes of nursing actions and compare them with expected outcomes to determine whether the goals are met. Interprofessional collaboration remains essential in providing nutritional support. So nutritional therapy does not always produce rapid results. You need to evaluate a patient's weight in comparison with his or her baseline weight, serum albumin or prealbumin, and protein and kilocalorie intake routinely. So the key element in preserving um, the health of an older adult is nutrition. So the quality and the quality and quantity of diet will help prevent delay the on delay the onset and manage chronic disease processes. So results of studies provide growing evidence that diet can affect longevity and when combined with lifestyle changes reduce disease risks. Of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, a lifetime of good nutrition would positively increase nine causes, or positively, positively improve nine causes. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic respiratory disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, nephrotic, nephrotic syndrome. Additionally, about 87% of elders have diabetes, hypertension, dys dyslipidemia, or combination of these diseases that have di dietary implications. Fulfillment of nutritional needs and aging is often affected by numerous factors. Proper nutrition means that all essential nutrients such as carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water are adequately supplied and used to maintain optimal health and wellness. Although some age-related changes in the gastrointestinal system do occur, these changes are rarely the primary factors in adequate nutrition. Fulfillment of nutritional needs and aging is more often affected by numerous other factors, including chronic disease, lifelong eating habits, ethnicity, socialization, income, transportation, housing, mood, food knowledge, functional impairments, and health, and, um, dentin and health. Data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey showed that U.S. adults continue to fall short in meeting recommendation dietary guidelines and socio-dynamic conditions influenced food choices and overall diet quality. So the U.S. Dietary Guidelines in 2010, the Dietary Guidelines for America, Americans published by the federal government, are designed to help promote health, reduce the risk of chronic diseases, and decrease the prevalence of overweight and obese people through improved nutrition and physical activity. The guidelines focus on balancing calories with physical activity, encourage Americans to consume more healthy foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fat-free and low-fat dairy products and seafood, and urge Americans to consume less sodium, saturated and trans fats, added sugars, and refined grains. In addition to key recommendations, there are recommendations for specific population groups, including older um, adults, to help reduce risks um, related to obesity and other diseases. So vitamin intake is generally good for older adults, and they should increase the consumption of crystalline form of B12 in their older age.
So now we're going to look at obesity in older adults. Usually, um, older adults are viewed as underweight and frail. However, the concern of obesity in older adults is increasing. Um, obesity is associated with increased health care costs, functional impairments, disability, chronic disease, and nursing home admissions. And weight loss recommendations for older adults must be carefully considered on an individual basis. So characteristics of malnutrition. So malnutrition is recognized as um, a geriatric syndrome. The rising incidence of malnutrition among older adults has been documented in acute care, long-term care, and the community. Malnutrition among older people is clearly a serious challenge for health care professionals in all settings. Malnutrition is a precursor to frailty and has serious consequences including infections, pressure ulcers, anemia, hypotension, impaired cognition, hip fractures, prolonged hospital stays, institutionalization, and increased morbidity and, mo morbidity and mortality. Malnourished older adults take 40% longer to recover from an illness, have two to three more times as many complications, and have hospital stays that are 90% longer. Malnutrition is a complex syndrome that develops following two primary trajectories. It can occur when the individual does not consume sufficient amounts of macronutrients like vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and macronutrients such protein as protein, carbohydrates, fat, and water required to maintain organ function and healthy tissue. This type of malnutrition can occur from prolonged undernutrition or overnutrition. In contrast, inflammation-related malnutrition develops as a consequence of injury, surgery, or disease states that trigger implement inflammatory mediators that contribute to increased metabolic rate and impaired nutrient utilization. Inflammation is increasingly identified as an important underlying factor that increase the risk for malnutrition and a contributing factor to, to suboptimal responses to nutritional intervention and increased risk of mortality. Weight loss frequently occurs in both traje traje trajectories. So here you can see a um, layout that's also in your book. So it takes the chronic medical condition, breaks down each condition, what you're going to do, detailed history, um, the psychiatric cognitive problems that you could possibly see, medications that can affect nutrition, oral health, restrictive diet, di diets, functional and social problems that can also affect health, um, nutrition related to health. So other, so other factors affecting um, fulfillment of nutrition is lifelong eating habits. How have they eaten through their life? Acute and chronic illnesses, medication regimens, or a lot of medications that cause um, elderly to not want to eat. They have no appetite. Ethnicity and culture, ability to obtain and prepare food. Um, this is a difficult thing. I live in a small 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 town um, all we have is one little convenience store and we have a gentleman who walks down there once a week and buys a few things and so he now does not have access to that because our um, convenience stores close and so people in the community have been pitching in to help get him to Walmart and the local grocery store to hopefully get um, more adequate food supplies for him mood socialization socioeconomic deprivation transportation and housing, and food knowledge. And so, unfortunately, in bigger cities, you have a lot of people, you think they live in a big city, they're going to have access to food, and that is not always true. You're going to have food islands, so where you have um, people that live in a certain area that has lots and lots and lots of food, and then you're going to have other people that live in a more um, neighborhood type area with houses and and no store and no transportation and maybe not enough money to use the local transportation and so they are going to have issues even though there's lots of food around within probably 10 miles if they can't get to it um, due to age or frailty then they're not going to be able to to have the nutrition they need so what are their lifelong eating habits these are developed out of tradition ethnicity and religion um, traditionally, I was raised on everything fried. Um, as an adult, I very rarely fry anything in a deep vat of fat and oil, um, except chicken strips, because that is the requirement. Um, 
but there's a lot of things that we traditionally learn, things that are eth eth in our ethnicity, our background, and our religion. Reflect the individual's um, dietary history and present food practices. So we need to know what they do now. Older, older adults may fall prey to advertisements that claim specific foods can reverse aging or rid them of chronic conditions. And this is so true. When my grandmother passed away a couple years ago, we went in and cleaned out her house just this last summer. And um, we found hundreds of bottles of this certain type of vitamin that was specific to help reduce um, aging and, and make you live longer. And, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bottles. And, you know, she did live to be in her 80s and she was a chronic smoker. But she also had a lot of health issues, too. And so, unfortunately, you know, when they're getting older, sometimes they may not have full-blown dementia or um, Alzheimer's, but they do become a little senile, maybe a little bit more gullible. And sometimes they do fall prey to um, scams and schemes. Essential nutrients should be obtained from food sources rather than supplements. And that is true in any person, not just the elderly. We need to make sure we're getting the majority of our nutrition from actual food products and not just supplements. So socialization, older adults may be isolated from social events during which food is provided. Effects of medications or disease processes may have caused a disinterest in food or excessive drinking of alcohol decreases eating habits. So older adults tend to um, somewhat be isolated if they're not invited to um, certain um, <clears throat> activities in the family or in the community because of their age or if say they they are in a nursing facility or assisted living facility but they're not able and capable to getting out to um, where this activity is occurring there's a lot of medications and diseases that cause you to not want to eat um, and then of course we know that at any age any type of excessive drinking is going to cause a problem chronic diseases so chronic diseases, functional and cognitive impairments associated with chronic disease interfere, interfere with the ability to shop, cook, and eat independently. Um, this is like your dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, any illness that's going to cause any kind of um, mental or physical disability. Medication side effects may further impair nutritional status. Dysphagia can be the result of behavioral sensory behavioral sensory or motor problems and is common in those with neurological diseases and dementia. And again, dysphagia, you see aspiration. So assessment of dysphagia. It is important to obtain a careful history of the older adult's response to dysphagia and to observe the person during mealtime. Symptoms that alert the nurse to possible swallowing problems are presented in box 10.4 in your textbook. Patients referred for a dysphagia evaluation or swallowing study must be assumed to have to be dysphagic or um, at risk for aspiration. Nothing by mouth, so an MPO status should be maintained until the swallowing evaluation is completed. During this period is necessary, if necessary, nutrition and hydration needs can be met by intravenous nasogastric or gastric um, tubes. A comprehensive evaluation by speech pathologist, usually including a video fluoroscopy recording of a modified barium swallow, should be considered when dysphagia is suspected. And I've actually seen one of these done, and it was on my daughter, not an elderly adult. Um, but they literally are given um, different um, thicknesses of liquids to swallow that has a little bit of the barium mixed with it so that way when they swallow you can actually see it go down their esophagus or maybe down their um, trachea and and so then they can go through you know thin nectar honey pudding and my daughter aspirated all the way up to honey, even with honey, but of course she was a toddler. And so we had to kind of do between nectar and honey and hoping that with that thickness, she wouldn't aspirate and have pneumonia again. So risk factors for dysphagia. So these are some of the things you're going to see potentially someone could develop dysphagia after. 
so a CVA, cerebral vascular accident or stroke, Parkinson's disease, neuromuscular disorders like ALS, MS, myasthenia gravis, dementia, head or neck cancer, traumatic brain injury, aspiration pneumonia, inadequate feeding techniques, or poor dentition, which is like chewing, poor chewing. So what are some interventions for dysphagia? After this following evalu evaluation, um, our goal should be a safe oral intake to maintain optimal nutrition and caloric needs. So a decision must be made about the potential for functional improvement of the swallowing disorder and the safety in swallowing liquids and solid foods. The goal is safe oral intake to maintain optimal, optimal nutrition and caloric needs. Nurses work closely with speech and language pathologists and the dietitian to implement interventions to prevent aspiration. Compensatory interventions include postural changes such as chin tucks or head turns while swallowing and modification of bolus volume, consistency, temperature, and rate of presentation. Diets may be modified in texture from pudding-like to nearly normal textured um, solids. Liquids can range from spoon thick, thick, honey thick nectar and thin. Commercial thickeners and um, thickened products are also available. And just a note, if you do have patients that use this thick, thickened liquids, the powder form, even if you follow the instructions on the side over time, will get thicker and thicker. So you have to be real careful. Um, if you make them a pitcher of water, I wouldn't do a full pitcher because it's, it's going to coagulate over time and then you're going to have to just remake it. The gel ones do not do this. They actually stay the consistency that you mix them as. Aspiration is the most profound and dangerous problem for older adults experiencing dysphagia. It is important to have a suction machine available at the bedside or in the dining room in the institutional setting. Suggested interventions helpful in preventing aspiration during hand feeding are presented in your Jerry book. So we have a question. The nurse is feeding an older patient with dysphagia after a stroke. Which intervention is most appropriate or most important when feeding this patient? So we're looking for the most important intervention and this person has dysphagia after a stroke. We know they're older, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. We just know the diagnosis is dysphagia. Serve only pureed foods. Well, possibly, potentially, but we don't know what this patient was assessed as by the speech pathologist to say what type of foods they should be eating. Okay, so I don't know if that's the most important. Offer small sips of fluid with each bite. Um, actually, this um, can put them at a higher risk of aspiration because um, they're swallowing liquid with um, um, a solid and so you have to be real careful when you're giving them liquids and solids together. Place food on the impaired side of the mouth. Well of course not. If it's on the impaired side they're not going to be able to chew so well on that side so we do know C is incorrect. Have this patient swallow twice between each mouthful and this is correct. So if facial weakness is present, place the food on the non-impaired side and alternate solids and liquid boluses. Not all persons require pureed foods. Okay, so this is why D is the most accurate. We want them to swallow and then chew, swallow again, and just to make sure they've cleared everything out of their mouth and they're not pocketing. So implications for gerontological nursing and healthy aging. So comprehensive nutritional screening and assessment are essential in identifying older adults at risk for nutrition problems who are malnutrition. Older people are less likely than young people to show signs of malnutrition and nutrient malabsorption. Evaluation of the nutritional health can be difficult in the absence of severe malnutrition, but a comprehensive assessment can reveal deficits. Screening and assessments of concern identified should be conducted on admission to the hospital, home health, or long-term care. Nutritional status changes as health status changes and ongoing assessment is also important. The role of nursing in nutrition assessment intervention should be comprehensive and include increased attention to process of eating and the entire ritual of meals, as well as the assessment of nutritional status within the interprofessional team. So comprehensive nutritional screening and assessment are essential in the modifying an older adults at risk for nutrition problems or who have been who are malnutrition. So our role as a nurse um, should be our assessment should be um, 
The role of nursing assessment and intervention should be comprehensive and include increased attention to process of eating an entire ritual of meals, assessment of nutritional status, and thorough medication review, because we know that medications can tend to cause um, problems eating. And so we're gonna look at some of the nutritional screenings. So nutritional screening is the first step in identifying patients um, who are at risk for malnutrition or have undetected malnutrition and determines the need for more comprehensive assessment and nutritional interventions. There are several screening tools that are specific to older individuals and the screening can be completed in any setting. So first we have the Nutritional Screening Initiative Checklist. It can be self-administered or completed by a family member or any member of the healthcare team. The second is the Mini Nutritional Assessment. This is, um, was actually created in Sweden um, by Nestle. It is both a screening tool and a detailed assessment. m and is only validated for individuals older than 65 and intended for use of um, professionals. If an individual scores less than 12 on the screen, then the assessment section should be completed. The Minima data set 3.0 uses a long-term care, used in long-term care facilities, includes assessment information that can be used to identify potential nutritional problems, risk factors, and the likelihood for improved function. Triggers for more thorough investigation of problems include weight loss, alterations in taste, medical therapies, prescription medications, hunger, parenteral or um, intravenous feedings, mechanically altered or therapeutic diets, percentage of food left uneaten, pressure ulcers, and edema. So on food and nutrient intakes, a frequently a 24-hour recall compared by with the MyPlate for older adults can provide an estimate of nutritional adequacy. When the individual cannot supply all of the requested information, it may be possible to obtain certain data from family members or another source such as the shopping receipt. There will be times, however, when information will not be complete as one would like, or the individual too proud to admit that he or she is not eating will furnish erroneous information. Even so, the nurse will be able to obtain additional information from, other three, from the other three areas of nutritional assessment. A three-day dietary record is completed by the individual or the caregiver as another assessment tool. What foods were eaten when they, the food was eaten and the amount eaten must be carefully recorded. Computer analysis of the dietary records provides information on energy and vitamin and mineral intake. Printouts can provide the older person and the healthcare provider with a visual graph of intake. So here is an example of the nutrition screening initiative. This is the one that can be done by the person themselves. So what are some interventions to increase food intake? Interventions are formulated around identified nutritional problems or um, nutritional problem or problems. Nursing interventions are centered on techniques to increase food intake and enhance manage and manage the environment to promote increased food intake. So this suggests that nurturing and nourishing describes the nurse's role in the nutritional care. Nurses can hold a pivotal role in ensuring adequate nutrition to promote healthy aging. Collaboration with the interprofessional team, dietitian, pharmacist, social worker, occupational therapist, speech therapist is important in planning interventions. And of course, you're always gonna include patient inter um, education in that. It's very important that the patient understands the reason that we are doing these things to promote. So implications for geriatrological nursing and healthy aging continued. So maintenance of adequate nutritional health as a person ages is extremely complex. Knowledge of nutritional needs is later in later years and of the many factors contributing to inadequate nutrition is essential for the geriatrological nurse and should be part of every assessment of an older person. Working with members of the interprofessional team and the appropriate assessment and development of the therapeutic interventions is a major role in the community, hospital and long term care setting. Use of evidence based practice protocols is important in determining nursing interventions to support and enhance nutritional status. Prevention of um, undernutrition and malnutrition and the maintenance of dietary needs and food are also ethical responsibilities. No old, older person should be hungry or thirsty because he or she cannot shop, cook, buy, prepare food, or eat independently. 
nor should any older person have to suffer because of the lack of assistance with the activities in whatever setting this person may be, reside. So we have a question. Which action should the nurse take first when teaching a widowed older patient living with his son about ways to improve nutrition? So which action should the nurse first take when teaching a widowed older patient living with his son about ways to improve nutrition? So A, recommend a liquid caloric supplement, possibly. B, determine who shops and prepares foods, possibly. Arrange for weekly transportation to the store, I don't know if that's a first. Collaborate with social workers for food stamps. And that's possible, but we're looking at what is the first thing we are looking at. Well, we need to be determine who shops and prepares the food. That's the first most important thing in determining nutrition interventions. So assessment is the first step in, in determining nutrition. So hydration management is the promotion of adequate fluid balance, which prevents complications resulting from abnormal or undesirable fluid levels. Daily needs for water can usually be met by functionally independent older adults through intake of fluids with meals and social drinks. However, a significant number of older adults, up to 85% of those 85 or older, drink less than one liter of water per day. Older adults, with the exception of those requiring fluid restrictions, should be at least consuming 1,500 mL of fluid per day. Maintenance of fluid balance, fluid intake equals fluid output, is essential to health regardless of a person's age. Medication use, um, sorry, age-related changes, medication use, functional impairments, and comorbid medical and emotional illnesses place some older adults at risk for changes in fluid balance, especially dehydration. Dehydration is defined clinically as a complex condition resulting in a reduction in total body water. In older people, dehydration most often develops as a result of disease, age-related changes, and, and or the effects of medication, and not primarily due to lack of access to water. Dehydration is considered a geriatric syndrome that is frequently associated with common diseases such diabetes, respiratory illness, heart failure, and frailty. It is often an unappreciated comorbid condition that exacerbates an underlying condition such as urinary tract infections, respiratory tract infection, or worsening depression. Dehydration is a significant risk factor for delirium, thromboembolic embolic complications, infections, kidney stones, constipation, and obstipation, balls, medication, toxicity, renal failure, seizure, electrolyte imbalances, hyperthermia, and delayed wound healing. So here is a list of risk factors related to dehydration. So the presence of physical or emotional illness, surgery, trauma, or conditions of higher physiological demands increase the risk of it demands increases the risk of dehydration. Individuals older than age 85 who have experienced volume de deficits. So risk factors of dehydration, the presence of physical or emotional illness, surgery, trauma, or conditions of higher physiological demands increases the risk of dehydration. Individuals older than age 85 who have experienced volume de deficit, weight loss, malnutrition or infection, and those with neurocognitive disorders and functional impairments are at higher risk for dehydration. When the fluid balance of an older adult is at risk and limited capacity of hemostatic mechanisms become significant. Chapter three discusses age-related changes in the body, um, in the amount of body water. So you can review that to help you better understand. So assessment, so prevention of dehydration is essential, but assessment in the, is complex in older people. Clinical signs may not appear until dehydration is advanced. Attention to risk factors for dehydration using a screening tool is very important. Additionally, older patients should be formally assessed for dehydration at the admission to the hospital and throughout their hospital stay. In addition, they assess, in addition, the MDS assesses for dehydration, fluid maintenance, 
Education should be provided to older adults and their caregivers about the need of fluids and the signs and symptoms of dehydration. Acute situations such as vomiting, diarrhea, and febrile episodes should be identified quickly and treated. So we need to provide education to the older people and their caregivers and then identify and quickly treat any of those complications that could cause dehydration. Signs and symptoms of dehydration. Typical signs and symptoms of dehydration may not always be present in older people and symptoms often are atypical. Skin turgor assessments at the sternum and commonly are at the sternum and commonly included in the assessment of dehydration. It is un an unreliable marker in older adults because of the loss of subcutaneous tissue with aging. Dry mucous membranes in the mouth and nose, longitudinal varrows of the tongue, osteostasis, speech incoherence, rapid pulse rate, increased urine output, or sorry, decreased urine output, extremity weakness, dry axilla, and sunken eyes are indicative of dehydration. However, the diagnosis of dehydration is biochemically proven with lab results. Hydration management. So interventions are derived from comprehensive assessment and cons consist of risk identification and dehydration management or an and hydration management. Any individual who develops fever, diarrhea, vomiting, or non-febrile infections should be monitored closely by implementing intake and output records and providing additional fluids. MPO, which is nothing by mouth, requirements for diagnostic tests and surgical procedures should be as short as possible for older adults. And adequate fluids should be given once tests and procedures are completed. A two-hour suspension of fluid intake is recommended for many procedures. So most of the time it's, it's MPO after midnight and most other than that you sometimes can go for two hours before but most of the time it's MPO after midnight. Oral hydration. So hydration management involves both acute and ongoing management of oral intake. Oral hydration is the first treatment approach to dehydration. Individuals with mild to moderate dehydration can drink and do not have significant mental or physical comprehensive attributable, attributable to fluid loss may be able to replenish fluids orally. Water is considered the first fluid to offer, but other clear fluids may also be useful depending on the person's preference. So rehydration methods depend on the severity of the type of, of dehydration and may include intravenous or hypo, hypodermoleculous approaches, or HDC. We're going to use that one. A general rule is to replace 50% of the loss within the first 12 hours or one liter a day in the afebrile elders or a sufficient quantity to relieve tachycardia and hypotension. Further fluid replacement can be administered more slowly over a longer period of time. It is important to monitor the symptoms of overhydration, so unexplained weight gain, pedal edema, neck vein distension, shortness of breath, especially in the individuals with heart disease or renal disease. Individuals taking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs should have serum sodium levels and hydration status closely monitored. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, because of risks for hyponatremia. Increasing fluid intake may aggravate an evolving hyponatremia. So question, when assessing a long-term care resident who has experience, been experiencing diarrhea, which of the following findings should lead the nurse to suspect that patient or the person is dehydrated? So let's look at these. Heart rate of 48, so that's hypotension, and we know with um, dehydration, one sign and symptom is a fast heart rate, which is hypertension, so that would not be true. Blood pressure of 170 over 90, so that is hypertensive, and again, we know that if they're dehydrated, their blood pressure is going to be low, so that is not true. Let's look at D, hyperactive bowel sounds in all quadrants, and this, again, is going to be not true because hyperactive means overactive and if they're dehydrated they're not bringing in the fluid and the intake they need so their bowels are probably going to be slow which would be hypoactive so urine output of 10 mls over four hours and this is true because we expect to see more than 30 mls an hour which would be 180 over four hours instead of 100. 
Thank you guys for putting up with my hoarseness, and I hope to see you soon.